Last year, there were 14 major wildfires in Colorado. 570 buildings were destroyed. Two lives were lost. In the Black Forest Fire alone, nearly $300 million in damages were paid out by insurers. This year, because of drought conditions ranging from severe to exceptional, the wildfire season in California has gotten off to an early start. By May 15th of this year, 9,000 acres had burned, 30 homes had been destroyed, thousands of people have had to evacuate. We've seen $20 million in damage. How can we prevent these kind of losses? Just asking that question raises the issue of limits. Ultimately, how we can prevent or predict or respond to wildfires is limited by our knowledge of the fire system itself, both in the aggregate and in detail. I'm using wildfire state as an example, but the problem is much broader than that. It's much more common. Pushing back on the limits of our knowledge is a multidisciplinary task. Looking at the behavior of fires, fires are affected by an incredible array of different factors that are seemingly unrelated to each other. You can look at the physics itself. The physics is, has limits. There's nothing humans can do about the limits in the physics. Our knowledge our, of the science of fires has limits. How do fires start? How do they spread? How does weather affect how fires evolve over time? How does terrain affect the way fires move across our landscape? There are social limits as well. To what extent will people accept the need to build defensible fire zones around their homes? They've got a beautiful ponderosa pine right next to their home. Are they going to cut that down because it's dropping pine needles on the roofs? Often not. There are political limits that we're facing. How far will governments go to build systems that can forecast and predict and detect wildfires? It's that age-old problem of looking at how many resources I have, finite resources applying against infinite needs in a way that benefits the most people. I submit, however, that the most pressing limit that we have to learn to overcome are the limits to our imagination. How can we take what we have today, the resources that are available to us today, and push back on the limits of our knowledge? I'm going to talk in the context of wildfires today and talk about two ways we can push back on the limits of knowledge. One is through technology. The other is through imagination. I'm going to talk about these two things in the context of a very specific technology, satellite remote sensing. So what do we need to do to protect ourselves from wildfire? The first thing we need is actionable information. Before fires even start, we have to understand what's the potential for fire this coming fire season. Are we in a drought? Were the rains sufficient over the past year to, to generate extra fuel? What's the potential of dry lightning? Once the fire starts, then we have to answer many more questions. What's the location? What's the intensity? What's the direction of movement of that fire? How much smoke is it putting out? Where's that smoke going? How does that affect air quality downwind. Remote sensing is able to answer all of these questions. Satellites can detect and measure the amount of biomass in specific regions of the Earth. Satellites can measure the amount of moisture in the soil. Satellites can predict the intensity of storms and the location of storms, storms that may have lightning that can affect and start fires. Satellites can detect fires that people can't even see in regions where people aren't even around. Satellites can track smoke plumes from fires 
not even across continents, but around the world. We can see these plumes move all around the world. You can measure the concentration of particulates in those plumes. You can measure the trace gases and how this affects our health. Satellites can do this globally. They can do it on time scales and over spatial extents that no other system on Earth can do. Our first weather satellite was launched in 1960. Since that time, remote sensing technology has advanced tremendously. So let's take a look at the last 30 years of, of satellite remote sensing te technology. I'll talk about three specific systems. The first is the Polar Operational Environmental Satellite System. Its current configuration with the current sensors on it started flying in the late 1970s. It's still flying today, various, in various incarnations. The second is the Earth Observing System. It's a NASA remote sensing satellite. It started flying in 1999. And the third is the Joint Polar Satellite System. All three of these satellites are in sun-synchronous polar orbits. This allows them to view every part of the Earth twice a day. So this is POSE, the Polar Operational Environmental Satellite System, which until May 1st of this year was the U.S.'s primary civilian weather satellite in a polar orbit. It's got a main sensor on it called AVHRR. This is the Aqua satellite. It's one of two in the Earth Observing System that has a sensor called MODIS on it. And this is the uh, SUMI NPP satellite. It's the very first of the new generation of polar orbiting satellites, the Joint Polar Satellite System. Starting May 1st of this year, it is now the U.S.'s primary civilian polar orbiting weather satellite. The main sensor on uh, NPP is called VEERS. So let's talk about AVHRR, first flown way back in the late 70s. It's a six-channel visible and infrared radiometer. When it looks straight down at the Earth, uh, looking at Nader, that's straight down, it has a resolution of about 1.1 kilometers. But it sweeps across the Earth so it can get a broad swath of information. As it sweeps away from Nader, the size of that footprint grows. So it's no longer 1.1 kilometers, it's bigger than that. When you look at the image, that's a smear in the image. So the edges of the image are not as clear as when you look straight down. This is an image from AVHR, it's channel one. It's a single frequency, so it's black and white. You'll notice the smoke from fires coming off here in kind of the center right. Using its thermal bands, AVHRR can detect the location of fires. This is from this year. It's day 152 of this year. This is all the fires in North America. So you can see the locations, but you can't see the intensity. Things got better in 1999 when the first MODIS was launched. MODIS is a 36-channel visible and infrared radiometer. It has two channels with a really good 250 meter resolution. It's got five channels with a 500 meter resolution. The rest of those channels are one kilometer. So about the same as AVHRR. Here's an image of fires in Southeast Asia. You'll notice, first of all, it's in color. That's more information being provided to the observer. That can, that can tell you right away where the smoke plumes are. You don't have to kind of pick them out. You can also see very clearly um, if you get up close, very clear, these red boxes, those are the fire detection boxes from the infrared uh, information that the MODIS provides. Then in 2011, October 2011, this year, uh, VIRS first flew. That's when the SUMI MPP was launched. VIRS is a 22-channel visible and infrared radiometer. It has five channels with a 370-meter, 375-meter resolution. It's got uh, the remainder of the channels with 750 meter resolution. The great thing about VIRS though, is when it's looking down at Nader and it scans out to the edge, the pixel sizes don't change. So unlike AVHRR where you get this big smear, or MODIS which you, when you get a, some smearing because it still has a problem with the pixels getting larger. With VIRS, you don't have that problem. So you have superior edge detection capabilities, you have superior resolution on your infrared channels. So VIRS can detect 
25% more wildfires than MODIS can, and many, many percent more than ABHRR. In fact, it can de detect fires at an earlier stage in their formation. So here's a picture from Veers. It's the entire swath edge to edge, 3,000 kilometers. As I zoom in on the center, you'll notice a red fire detection box right in the middle and a smoke plume coming off that. That's the Waldo Canyon fire, 2012, right here in Colorado. As I move over to the edge, we're looking at California now, you notice that the, the resolution, the information, the detail in that picture is just as good as it was in the center. But there's more to VIRS. The really, really great thing about VIRS is this new capability. It's called the day-night band. This is the first high-resolution, visible spectrum, nighttime imagery available for civilian use in near real time. So here we have a picture of uh, the day-night band of Idaho and Montana at night. Some wildfires going on up there. The fires themselves are clearly visible very bright. But you can also see these other bright lights. Those are towns and cities around uh, the fire. You can see the smoke plume coming off the fire. You can see weather. You can see clouds over here in the west. You can see fog over here in the east. All that information has never been available to fire managers before at night. A noticeable improvement in technology. So what I've talked about in terms of technology changing over the years is a pretty obvious way to push back the limits of knowledge. But we can't depend on that for everything. We can't look for a technological fix. We've got to use our imagination in ways to take information we have today and use it in new and unique ways to push back on the limits of this knowledge. Veers was built with a very specific fire detection band. It's called the M13 band. It's a mid-infrared, 4 micron, dual gain, moderate resolution band. So what all that means is 750 meters of resolution, so it's moderate resolution. <laughs> it has dual gain, unlike most of the channels, which are single gain. Dual gain lets you look at a hot spot and actually measure the temperature of that hot spot. If you had a single gain channel, it would just saturate. It wouldn't, wouldn't get that information. But it's 750 meters. And, and on beers, hey, we like our 375 meter information. We like that high resolution stuff. So as great as M13 is, we're, we're left wanting a little bit more. So Dr. Wilfred Schroeder of the University of Maryland had a great idea. He said, what if we take that M13 band? We'll take the, the fire radiative power. We'll take the fire intensity information for that, but we'll complement that with a high resolution infrared band that can give us more detail about where the fire is located. So use these two things together. So all we have here is an image of a fire in Brazil. On the left is the MODIS one kilometer infrared image of the fire. On the right is this I-4 band. That's the band that's 375 meters infrared from Beers. If you look at the, the colors, the colors indicate different times at which the measurements were made. So looking at the MODIS view, you see that there's a fire there, the fire's changing, it's kind of moving around, not quite sure what it's doing over time. But you look at that, that I-4 band, you can see exactly where that fire front is, exactly how it moves day to day to day. A huge improvement for fire management. The I-4 band was not designed for fire detection. That didn't stop Dr. Schroeder. He was able to use existing information in an innovative way to push back on the limits of our knowledge of these fires. The current sensors that we have today, the, the, the advanced ones that I've been talking about, like the beers, they're not going to change for the next 15 or 20 years. We built them, we spent the money, we're going to stamp them out, we're going to fly them. We can't depend on technological changes to push back on limits for the next generation. We've got to be able to look at new ways, use our imagination <coughs> to find 
clever ways to get more information out of our existing systems. I'm going to step away from wildfires. I'm going to talk in my last example about how people have used the day-night band in very innovative ways and come up with some extremely surprising results. Using the day-night band, you can detect <laughs> city lights at very high resolutions. Over time, you can see how the patterns and the lights change. The image on the left, before Hurricane Sandy hit. Image on the right, after Hurricane Sandy hit. Looking at the patterns of the lights, you can tell immediately where there are power outages. <laughs> if you're a power manager, if you work for a power company, if you're uh, an emergency resource person, you want to know this. You have an information poor area because there's no power. You need to know where to restore it. Here's your information. Here's where you send your troops. But the thing about the day-night band, it doesn't tell you just where the lights are. There's enough information in that stream that you can derive electrical power consumption. So once you've done that, researchers in China and researchers in the United States have been able to measure and determine electrical power consumption in specific regions and correlate that with gross domestic product. This is an environmental sensor. Now we've used our imagination to use the information that's available to us to determine economic measurements. Environmental sensor measuring economic trends. But why stop there? Let's look at electrical power consumption as a time series. Look at it over time and look at that, how it changes in relation to major cultural events. Romain and Stokes did just exactly this. They looked at how power consumption changes over time around major religious holidays. They did this over different religions all across the world. They found some very surprising things. They found that the way people behave around major religious holidays is very similar, regardless of the religion. They looked in great detail in, in uh, Egypt around Ramadan. They were finding that they could get information on specific neighborhoods and correlate that with differences in religious practices within Islam. From that, they can develop maps of religious practices within a given region and differences in those practices. They can correlate that with other behavioral changes, like voting patterns. That's extraordinary. Here we have a mission designed to measure the environment. And using our imagination, we step back, measure socioeconomic trends, measure, measure cultural trends, measure political trends, all from imagination. So I've talked today about two ways to push back, technological means, and more importantly, imagination. We can use our imagination to, to pull information out of the systems that we have today to sidestep some of those limits that frustrate us every day. Limits in resources, limits in funding, limits in political will. Humans don't lack imagination. Use that. Go out and push, push back against the, the limits of knowledge. <laughs>